Welcome to the 2022 Lab Roots Life Science Microscopy Series. My name is Leah Lavery, Marketing Manager for Life Science Electron Microscopy from the Thermo Fisher Scientific and your moderator today. Welcome back to any returning attendees and a big hello to new attendees wherever you are in the world. Uh, many of you know Thermo Fisher from other life science areas, but I want to introduce you to the Life Science Electron Microscopy Division. Our division provides complete workflows from cryo-electron microscopy solutions, um, from structural determination to macular complexes and native state, and to 3D construction of image tissues and cells. So today, so, uh, we're talking about cellular cryo-electron tomography, which is a high-resolution technique that enables electron imaging of molecular machinery at a cell at close to native conditions. Today's speakers, Alex Rigard and Michael Grange, will be sharing how cryoelectron tomography is applied to answer various biological questions and how the workflow is enhanced with the capabilities of the new Arctis cryoplasma fib. Uh, we encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask the Question box at any time and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of today's presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have any trouble seeing or hearing the pre today's presentation. Today's presentation is titled Arctis Cryoplasma Fib for Throughput and Connectivity in Cellular Cryoelectron Tomography. Our speaker, Alex Rigert, works as a product marketing manager for Thermo Fisher Scientific. He developed and used cryo focused IMV instrumentation for applications in electron tomography at the Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry in Munich and has more than 15 years' experience in cryo electron microscopy. Our second speaker, we welcome from the Rosalind Franklin Institute, Michael Grange. Michael completed his uh, Doctor in Philosophy in Structural Biology in the University of Oxford in the UK, where he applied FIB milling, electron tomography, and super resolution microscopy to investigate the trafficking and egress of viral progeny within the cells. After his doctoral studies, he moved to the Mass Plaque Institute for Molecular Physiology in Germany as an EMBO long-term fellow. During his fellowship, he established CryoT as a core method and was involved in establishing high throughput FIB milling workflows and combined them to investigate the structure and architecture of isolated mammalian muscle and human stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. In 2021, he joined the Franklin as a group leader where his research uses an institute structural techniques to determine the impact of disease, relevant genetic alterations on the structural cell biology of axonal plasticity with an emphasis on cytosolism trafficking and structural alterations with the neuron. He also develops methods for cryo-ET and the correlative imaging of larger tissues and structural studies. So Thermo Fisher and Rosalind Franklin have been working together since 2019 to determine really what's next for cryo-EM. Before we get our talk, let's take a quick look at a visit to the RFI via this video. The Rosalind Franklin Institute is really the sort of brainchild of Sir John Bell. John had this idea that the UK needed to have a high risk, high reward institute. And that institute would be focused on our understanding of disease and the new treatments and cures for some of the diseases that afflict us. The goal of the Franklin is to change how we think about some of the most complex diseases and therefore find better ways to treat them. The whole point of cryo-electron tomography is we're going to look inside the cell for what the protein is doing inside the cell. So not only what does it look like inside the cell, but who's it talking to, who are its neighbors, and what's the consequence of those interactions. We're very interested in being able to look inside the tissue of model systems and look for the early stages of the disease as a means to cure that disease, I think is, is really an exciting possibility. The Rosalind Franklin and Thermo Fisher have been collaborating really since 2018 on the development of new plasma fib technologies. That's now come into being with the Arctis machine, and that's a brand new plasma fib, which is highly automated and powerful machine that's going to simplify the workflow for groups across the world. And what we've been working with Thermo to do is to make this technology easy to use and as applicable as possible because there's a power comes from when everybody can apply a technique to these big problems. We're entirely collaborative here at the Franklin. We've worked with Thermo for a number of years with us visiting Thermo 
and Thermal coming to visit us. But it's not just Thermal that come here. We have collaborations across the UK and across the world with people we share ideas and share technology. And so we're all in the same race against these diseases, not with each other, but it's against the... Thank you very much, Leah, for this introduction. And also on behalf of Michael and myself, um, welcome to this Arctis Cryoplasma FIP webinar. Yeah, the Arctis system is our new sample preparation system for electron tomography. And I want to give you here a, a quick overview about the principle of thinning cells for tomography. You can see the Arctis system on the uh, left-hand side. This is a focused ion beam system. Uh, in this case, uh, we have a plasma focused ion beam source. Uh, what we do with the Arctic system is we are thinning cells down to make them electron transparent so that we can image them in the uh, transmission electron microscope. You can see the uh, cryos G4 here in the middle of the slide. So what the Arctis uh, does is it produces an ion beam that we can direct site specifically to a frozen hydrated cell. This cell is typically residing on an electron microscopy grid. And then we use this beam to thin it down to mill away uh, cellular material and thereby create a thin electron transparent lamella. These lamella are called in situ lamella and provide an, uh, a view into the frozen hydrated interior of the cell. Once we have prepared the cell in that way, we can transfer the lamella into the uh, transmission electron microscope uh, this is, uh, again, the cryos that you can see here. In the transmission electron microscope, we acquire the tomogram. And we do that in the following way. We are not rotating the electron source around the sample. Instead, we tilt the sample under the electron beam and uh, acquire a so-called tomographic tilt series, so many different images of the sample at different tilt angles. And from this tilt series, we can then uh, back project um, uh, into a tomogram um, and then create uh, the, the tomographic image. And that's what you can see here. So, and the advantage of such a tomogram is, of course, that it not only provides information about the structural uh, details of individual proteins, but also contextual information about um, uh, the proteins residing into, uh, inside the, uh, the cellular context. Tomography can be done on a range of different types of samples. So that's summarized in this um, slide. Um, there are different thicknesses of the different objects. Um, if you, for instance, take a look at the left-hand side, protein, virus particles, those can be plunge frozen and they don't require uh, thinning at all because they are thin enough. So you can directly image them in the uh, transmission electron microscope. But whenever you go to more complex samples, and they can even start from bacterial cells over to, to, uh, to eukaryotic cells, then up to uh, larger objects like tissue cells, small organoids, or then even bulk tissue or small organisms, um, then definitely some way uh, of thinning is required um, to make the sample accessible for transmission electron microscopy. Um, and that's why we need to have the focused ion beam instrument, the Arctis system, to uh, make the samples accessible for tomography. So um, a lot of the samples um, are frozen by the ways of plunge freezing. Um, when the objects get thicker and you need to freeze objects that are larger than 5 or 10 microns, then we have to revert to high pressure freezing, which is a method which can uh, vitrify objects up to 200 microns. Um, this um, freezing type produces more bulk samples. So here again, uh, different techniques have to be applied to, um, to work them with these samples. In general, what we do for most samples uh, on crits, we prepare, as I explained before, this uh, in situ uh, lamellae on the crit. So we thin the cells or the objects directly on the crit. Um, as you will see later, we can do that with the Arctis also for some cells that we freeze in uh, so-called waffle lamella methods, so thin ice disks, where we kind of use the ion beam, especially the plasma fib beam, uh, to remove bulk ice and then produce large lamellis from that sample. And then if we go to more complex samples like uh, bulk 
tissue or even small organisms or something which is frozen in what you can see on the right hand side here, a planchet sample, then there are different techniques employed, for instance, um, uh, the cryo lift out technique. So in general, tomography works for a large range of different samples. These samples have different requirements for freezing them, either by plunge freezing or high pressure freezing. Uh, for most of these samples, it is required to thin them down to make them accessible for tomography. And that's why the cryofib milling technique uh, is so important and um, why we also have the Arctis system for this essential step of sample preparation for tomography. Yeah, with this, I would like to end this short introduction and uh, pass it on to Michael to uh, give you uh, a short introduction into the Rosalind Franklin Institute and his work uh, at the RFI. Uh, Michael, over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Alex. So before I actually delve into some of the applications uh, that we're using the Arctis for, um, I'd just like to briefly introduce the Rosalind Franklin Institute. Uh, the Rosalind Franklin Institute was established to fill a gap in the UK life science sector as a place where high risk, high reward technologies can be developed that may not actually be possible at other institutes across the UK. And its mission really is to bring together physicists, chemists and life scientists to promote and develop technologies that may otherwise uh, impact on key challenges in health and life sciences. Um, one key area that was identified was electron cryotomography, which due to the fact that it can image molecules in tissues and in cells, uh, has promise of being a, a technique where it may be possible to develop uh, an era of atomic pathology. And, and my group is really investigating different aspects of neurobiology to be able to try and probe cytoskeletal organization an axonal organization uh, and really the, the, the goal is to be able to determine structures in situ that are only possible through this means. Um, so this is work by uh, Ava who is a postdoc in my group and she's investigating the role of TRIM46 in bundling microtubules and understanding their requirement for maintaining axon polarity. Uh, how this occurs is actually not well understood. Um, and the structures of how these microtubules are fasciculated by trim 46 is not known. So we were actually trying to develop methods to recapitulate this in vitro for structure determination. And this really needs correlative methods that are able to target specifically labeled cells um, for cryo-T. And ideally that needs to be coincident on the fly. And we've actually been extending this further to primary cells um, where we try to uh, target proximal regions to the soma which are important in maintaining uh, neuronal polarity. So this is some of Jake's work who's a PhD student uh, who's been trying to target the axon initial segments. Neurons are quite diverse so we need to be able to target regions specifically to understand their role and their function and this is important if we want to get an idea and a handle on how cytos cytoskeletal organization uh, achieves this. Uh, and we've been using the Arctis to generate lamella of these proximal regions. And on the right, you can see one such region where you see microtubules um, and tubules, which are uh, studded with a membrane protein endophilin. And this can be seen on a, on a molecular scale. Now, obviously targeting is one aspect of, um, of this workflow, but the other is actually being able to produce high volumes of data from multiple different cell types. And the reason why that's important is because if we take a disease uh, model and we want to investigate mutations relevant to disease, we actually have to be able to take cell lines and identify features that are mapped onto isogenic controls. And so because um, the Arctis has 12 grids at a time and that we can actually have efficient screening and sample loading in a low contamination environment, we now have the tool which allows us to really try and push the applicability of this. So Bronwyn, is a PhD student who's working at um, patient-derived samples to investigate molecular changes in the endolysosomal system. And she's going to be able to build up enough data to actually use machine learning to, uh, to match and investigate changes in that system across different cell types. And so she can investigate enough controls, enough mutable lines to actually begin to get statistical groundings for her observations. And it's not just you know neuronal cells that we can look at. We also can start to look at pathogenic um, 
problems. In this case, uh, this is some of Helena Watson's work, who's a PhD student in gymnasiumics group, where uh, she's studying the effect of antiviral bacterial defense mechanisms, where um, when activated, a TRS-saved TRS protein assembles into filamentous structures. And this happens in vitro, but actually, how does this occur inside bacteria? How does this occur um, at different stages of bacterial pathogenesis? And so they've been using the actus touch, the mill lamella, and take cryogenic tomography data of these bacteria where they can observe these filamentous structures. And so really the goal of um, the electron cryotomography project at the RFI and our collaboration with Thermo is really to try and increase throughput and to increase the ease at which uh, cryotron tomography can be implemented. So that you simply have to define your project, identify what it is you want to target, locate that object using either um, optical microscopy or other means, transferring those samples simply, shaping the sample so that you can then perform electron cryotomography, performing the electron cryotomography, and then finally, um, applying machine learning and different segmentation and sub average uh, methods to actually molecularly characterize the data. And this is actually something that's desperately needed. Um, so this is a slide that I put together with Sebastian Tacker in Dortmund around 2020, where we were trying to understand the cryotron tomography in situ structural biology landscape um, at that time. And you can see that it, the workflow was really fragmented. So each box represents a sort of individual handling step or a point where you might have to transfer between a different um, apparatus. And there really were quite a lot of manual steps, which gives a lot of room for error. Um, you know, spending time awkwardly loading grids uh, in order to achieve the right orientation for the tomography or moving it to a different modality and all of which have different effects on data quality either contamination or uh, changes from the ideal tilt axis which can lead to uh, aberrations or a, a sort of deterioration in your sample quality or your, your tomograph, tomogram quality at the endpoint. And so the idea was really to simplify all of this so that you can handle the samples robotically under a vacuum, um, implementing correlative methods that can be performed uh, concomitantly uh, and so that everything is more simplified and that all the transfer steps or the majority of the transfer steps are removed. And the microscopy landscape at the Roslyn Franklin Institute looks like this. We have uh, a Helios Hydra, which we call Roslind, which was uh, the first instrument which enabled us to get hands on with plasma to understand how, um, how different it might be to gallium. Um, to use fluorescence targeting, albeit in this case off axis. Um, and we're also able to explore uh, serial FibSem to, to, to perform photometric imaging of tissues and cells. We then took delivery of um, our prototype Arctis, which took into account all of the different workflow aspects that we wanted to improve. Um, and this was the first of a kind PFib where it has extended operation time, so it can be used for more than a week. Uh, more specimen support and coincident for instance. And we also have a, a Cryos G4, which we call Dorothy, which has an extended tilt range, um, has a search as Falcon 4 and is Cryos M capable. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Alex, who will tell you more about the Arctis itself. Yeah, let me go into a little bit more details on the Arctis system and see how that's positioned in the tomography workflow. Here you can see again the workflow uh, with uh, the essential steps from the site culture over the vitrification step into the lamella making and the correlative microscopy that we do with the Arctis system uh, until uh, the TEM tomography part where we acquire uh, the 3D information from the sample and process it. On the Arctic system, we use a different type of uh, focus ion beam compared to the uh, gallium based system uh, on an Aquilos. So here we utilize a plasma focused ion beam that comes from an inductively coupled plasma ion source. So the way the, the beam is formed, you can see on this slide, um, uh, 
we have different gas species that we can utilize to form different plasma beams. So in our case, xenon, argon, and oxygen. So the gas uh, comes from small cylinders, which is kind of going into a plasma cell in the ion beam column. Uh, we couple in energy into that plasma cell, ionizing the gas species, and then applying extraction optics uh, to extract the ions, um, collimate them, and focus them into a, a beam uh, that then is used to sputter away material um, on, the, on the system. Uh, there are certain advantages on the plasma field beam. Uh, most of all, there's no gallium implantation compared to a, a liquid metal ion source. And of course, the plasma field beam also has excellent fine milling and bulk material removal capabilities that we can uh, use on the Arctis system. Here's a more detailed view of the technology of the Arctis. Um, so you will see uh, what is behind the, the enclosure here. On the schematic on the right hand side, you can see key components. Um, some of these uh, components are derived from uh, TEM technology, such as the auto loader and the compute stage. So the auto loader is the robotic loading system that um, enables us to load up to 12 grids into the Arctis system. The grids are picked up with a compute stage. Um, the sample can then be manipulated with the uh, plasma FIP source, so with the uh, focused ion beam. We have an SEM column to image the sample and provide navigational uh, capabilities. For the first time, we also have a light microscope at the coincidence point of all three beams, so of the ion beam, electron beam, and the light microscope uh, beam here. So um, that enables us to do light microscopy at the same position where we also do the milling. So we don't need to move to an external position for light microscopy imaging in the system. Uh, we made sure that the system is uh, well uh, shielded uh, in terms of contamination protection uh, with a dedicated cryo box. Uh, we also uh, made a complete redesigned vacuum chamber for that uh, purpose. And we also have other capabilities on the system, uh, such as the gas injection system, the GIS system, which provides the protective coding for producing in situ lamelli as well as a sputter target that we can move in and then knock on with the uh, power of the plasma fit beam to produce a conductive, a very thin nanometer thick um, coating, conductive coating uh, onto the sample, which is important for later data acquisition in the TEM. The whole system, um, as you can see on the left side, is in a biosafety enclosure, uh, providing a shielding from the environment uh, to the interior of the, of the system. This slide shows you the sample loading uh, of the Arctis system with the auto loader. What you can see here is a cut open view of the robotic sample loading system. Um, so once the user has loaded samples um, to this auto loader, um, the system will pick up the samples. The samples are in a cassette that holds 12 grid positions. And then we have uh, a gripper arm which picks one of these grids and moves it into the high vacuum chamber into the compute stage. And once we have the sample in the compute stage, we can uh, manipulate it with the ion beam, image it with the electron beam, uh, and also utilize the fluorescence light microscope um, to uh, detect fluorescence from the sample. Another novelty on the Arctis is the uh, new uh, sample carrier, the Tomocrit. You can see that on uh, this slide here. So this is what we call the Tomocrit. Um, it's important to have an autoloader compatible grid carrier system. Traditionally, um, uh, such auto grids were round objects. And the reason why we gave the Tomo grid um, two flat sides, as shown here on the left side, uh, in the TEM system, we have to load the uh, auto grids into the compute stage. And uh, for the lamella use case, it's quite important that the lamella milling axis is aligned. Uh, well to the TEM tilt axis. Ideally, the TEM tilt axis is 90 degree perpendicular to the milling axis. And by um, giving the uh, new grid carrier, the Tomo grid, this flat sides, we can make sure that uh, we always have the correct orientation of the FIP milling axis towards the TEM tilt axis so that we can maximize also the, the area that we can obtain during tilting the sample. Because if you have a sample which is not well aligned, as you see here, uh, and that can cause that we get some shadowing when we kind of uh, tilt the sample and that uh, loses or that 
causes then uh, that we uh, not have the full area accessible for tomography data acquisition. So this is kind of um, uh, solved here with the, with the new TomoGrid concept that makes sure that the milling axis is um, perfectly aligned to the TEM tilt axis. The Arctic system always comes with an integrated uh, light microscope. This light microscope is um, mounted at the uh, beam coincidence position. Uh, you see that in the schematic here um, on the left hand side. Um, so uh, the light microscope is mounted underneath and uh, we can image the sample. Uh, there is a way to flip the compute stage 180 degrees. So in, in, to, in case we are imaging SICA samples, we can do that uh, from both directions. We can manipulate the sample at the same position with the ion beam and image it with the electron beam and also obtain the fluorescence information um, straight from that um, same coincidence point. So there's no need to move to an external imaging position on the light microscope. Um, we have uh, the objective with the piezo uh, that is part of the high vacuum chamber. And then on the light pass, we um, uh, pass a vacuum window here. Um, the uh, excitation comes from an LED light source. Um, and on the uh, emission pass, we, uh, once we pass the dichroic, we go here through an emission filter before we go to uh, a CMOS camera on the system. Now, the advantage is that we uh, don't need to move to an external uh, or kind of a, an off-axis uh, light microscopy image position. We can uh, keep the sample in the same position where we produce the lamellae, as you can see in this small animation movie. So we have um, imaging uh, of SEM, uh, light microscope, and also the ion milling all at the same coincidence point with that system. The objective we are using here is a 100x objective uh, with a uh, numerical aperture of 0.75 at a working distance of uh, 4 millimeters. We are also developing a new user control software for the Arctis. The idea here is to go away from a variety of single packages that are needed to prepare uh, lamellae from cells and to provide rather a comprehensive unified user interface where the full lamella preparation can be done within that single software. So we call it the Arctis user interface. It's accessible from anywhere, so that means uh, there's no need to sit next to the microscope to control it, uh, to do the lamella preparation, but um, go, for instance, to a computer room or to the office desk, then access the Arctis via the uh, uh, web. And um, what you see will be a, a web user interface like this, which gives you, first of all, uh, an overview about the samples which are loaded into the uh, system. So the outer loader, as I mentioned before, has 12 different sample positions. You can see here there's a couple of samples, a couple of different samples which are loaded into that 12 positions. Uh, the first thing in this user interface will be to acquire the grid overview maps. That's something the system is doing autonomously uh, after sample loading. So you can see here there will be a gallery of different uh, samples which are loaded to the system. Now you can access individual samples by clicking on these galleries and that will provide the grid overviews. Um, that's uh, a map of the grids that are loaded into the system where the user now can uh, select regions where lamellae uh, should be prepared. There will be also some templates that can be adjusted to the different specimens uh, that are loaded. So uh, each specimen may have some different milling parameters. Those parameters can be stored in a template and then recalled. And then the system will present uh, to the user uh, the milling sites and then it's up to the user to define where the lamella should be placed and how um, the pattern parameters um, uh, should look like. So there's some flexibility to adjust this. After this, this information is stored to the system and the system then starts to process the sample autonomously until the final lamella is produced. So that really goes down all the way uh, until uh, final lamella production, final polishing. And of course, there will be also a, a function to integrate the light microscopy information into that workflow. So that is done before to identify regions of interest, but also after a lamella is uh, being produced, we can use the light microscope, like it is shown here, to, um, to check uh, the fluorescence in the prepared lamellae directly on the system. 
So that's um, the software concept behind that current work in progress. That gives you an idea on um, the, uh, the concept here. Yeah, before we take a closer look at the application work uh, with the Arctis, I would like to give an overview on the type of samples that we can process with this uh, new system. And I would like to start here first with samples which originate from plant freezing. So you can see here the schematic of the technique. So it's uh, one of the most versatile techniques that is used today um, to prepare cellular samples for tomography. It works for a variety of different cells, so both adherent cells or suspension cells, or cells which are grown on crits, uh, whether that be uh, primary cells or uh, cell lines. They can be frozen by a plant freezing technique, by immersing, Im immersing them into liquid esane very rapidly. That uh, will cause the cells uh, embedded in a, in a vitreous layer of ice. These uh, crits, which are prepared in that way, they are then clipped into the new tomocrit carrier. And then the uh, goal is, of course, to produce as many lamellae on the crit as possible. Um, we do that in the, in the way I explained it before, with on the crit thinning or producing this in situ cryolamellae. And the clear uh, task and goal here for the Arctis is to uh, do this type of lamella production with a much higher throughput uh, than we uh, have done that before. Uh, on the existing cryofib systems. I mentioned in the beginning in my overview of uh, samples that can be used for tomography, there are also thicker samples which require a second technique to uh, vitrify them, and that's high pressure freezing. So we can also work with high pressure frozen samples with the Arctis system, and in a way that doesn't require a lift out system. Uh, you can see that on this slide, so this gives you an example on the, the way these samples are produced. So uh, we have a grid which is sandwiched in between uh, high pressure freezing planchets. So these are uh, the, uh, the components that go into the high pressure freezer. On the sample, on the grid, we can have now a more bulk sample that can be, for instance, a small organoid that we, we can uh, use here to freeze it in that way. The grid is sandwiched in between the two uh, planchets. Those planchets go into the high pressure freezer. Then the main principle of the high pressure freezer is to apply a high pressure, which in turn lowers the freezing point of water. So in the end, we can uh, vitrify objects up to uh, approximately 200 microns in thickness. Um, the outcome of such a sandwich grid uh, HPF freezing experiment is a, a frozen disk uh, bulk material, which is vitrified on the grid. Uh, also called a, a waffle grid, um, and that contains a sample now which is embedded in bulk ice. Um, now, such a grid can be loaded into the tomocrit uh, carrier that I explained before. And here is the real advantage also of the plasma fib beam because initially we need to uh, really uh, remove uh, a lot of uh, bulk ice material before we can start to. Uh, to uh, lamella milling geometry. So the idea here is really to use the plasma beam to first cut out, make these rough cuts, removing uh, bulk ice material from such samples. And then we can utilize the beam uh, to uh, make a lamella with the same geometries that are conceptually similar, like the in situ lamellae. And that way we can produce relatively large lamellae. So that's uh, also what has been described in the uh, Waffle Technic uh, paper. And the plasma fib is for such a preparation, of course, advantageous because large volumes of ice need to be removed, and that's um, uh, faster doable with a plasma beam compared to the to the gallium fib. I would like to turn it now over to Michael to talk a little bit about the application work um, he and the group uh, is doing at uh, RFI. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, I'd just like to spend a bit of time to go through some attempts we've been making to characterize plasma and try to get handle on, on how the Arctis might perform. And this is work by Caspar Berger, uh, Maud de Moore, and Thomas Glenn. And we've been using the Arctis to explore automated milling and what we can achieve with plasma. In this case, we used argon. Um, and on the left, you can see how the grids look. Um, an example of of a lamella generated via argon. Um, the lamella looks smooth, it looks uniform and, and with very little curtaining. And from the fib view, it looks thin. Um, and we're able to get 
26 lamella from 34 initial positions in an automated fashion. Most of these were lost after the rough milling step. Um, and each lamella took approximately 45 minutes to mill and polish without any user intervention. And this was really a trying to map the known protocols from gallium onto the argon plasma just to see how it performs and what we, results we may be able to get if we just sort of use plasma um, in a vanilla fashion. So that's, you know, what, two nanoamps rough milling, approximately 2.2 2 nanoamps um, medium milling, and then polishing with, with, with PQAMP scale uh, currents. And of these 26 lamella that we generated, we were able to try, acquire tomograms on 18 of them. You know, and this was the, last, the lack of tomograms on some of them was due to classic issues relating to, you know, plunge frozen cells, cracks in the grid, bad ice, you know, problems with the vitrification or just there not being any regions of interest. But you can see that the lamella that we can produce have, to, uh, have nice features. They have rough ER. They have RMP bolts, ribonucleic protein bolts, microtubules, cop vesicles can be readily identified. So this gave us confidence that you know the, the lamella were good, that we could get good results from these data. But before we went through to sub volume averaging, we want to get a handle on on kind of what thickness we generate with the plasma and how what the profile of those lamella are. And surprisingly, when we looked into the details of our tomograms and analyzed the, the thicknesses, um, the, the thickness of the tomograms was quite high. There's quite a large distribution. So the average thickness is 250 nanometers, but it varies from 150 nanometers up to around 380, 400 nanometers, which for me, for me was quite a surprise because often thick lamella have been difficult to image. And typically the features are um, quite low contrast in thicker specimens. But this, you know, this is this gave us a this is quite promising because if you can get good data from thick specimens, you know, then there's no need to have very thin lamella, and it, there's a chance to get more volume of your sample of interest. And just to let you judge for yourself, here are some example tomograms from um, from different thicknesses, where on the left you have 138 nanometers and on the right 350. And although the contrast on the left looks a bit better, you can still identify plenty of ribosomes on the thick uh, tomogram compared to the thin. So this this made us think that actually they might be able to contribute somewhat to the sublime averaging um, and give high resolution data. And indeed, we're able to map the positions of ribosomes across our 180 tomograms and determine the structure of, of the human ribosome from our HeLa cell data to a resolution globally of 4.9, but you can see from the the, uh, the local resolution map, a lot of this resolution is at 3.8, which for us is close to the Nyquist limit of the tomography uh, data that we acquired. And importantly, it's particle contributions to this structure actually still include some of those thicker tomograms, and they're not just simply removed after classification, which is quite promising. We use the warp uh, M reliant pipeline to determine the structure um, with one line reconstruction using RTOMO. Um, this includes 15,600 ribosomes from around 149 tomograms, and um, the 60S subunit is around 4.3 globally. And you can see side chains, so you can see that this really is a pseudo atomic resolution. Um, and so plasma really does allow us to get actually pseudo atomic resolution scale information from cells. Um, and I, one question that's been asked a lot is what is the kind of effect of plasma on, on damage to the lamella and how, how that might impact on subatomic averaging? Um, and so considering how thick our data are, like how much of that is really usable, how far into the lamella does the plasma ion beam actually impart damage. Um, and so we've been making some first steps to try and characterize this dam damage layer, which is in a way that's relevant to some volume averaging and to the ability to determine structures on a pseudo-atomic scale. So what we did is actually map particle distance from the lamella edge 
and compared the ability uh, to reconstruct particles within and without that space to a high resolution. And for a distance of 30 nanometers from the edge, we identified 2,099 particles, which we were able to determine a structure for. Um, this structure went to 9.2 angstroms, and we then took 2,099 particles from random positions throughout our data in the center of our lamella um, and determine the structure from those, and that went to eight angstroms. And so particles close to the edge did actually not reconstruct to as high resolution, indicating that there is a reduced alignment capability um, of particles close to the edge, which we attribute to particle damage. The particles close to the surface had a larger B factor, meaning that you need more of those particles to actually reconstruct to the same resolution. And what we take away from that is that this could have consequences for very thin lamella where um, the damage could potentially be all, if not, if not the majority, but all of the usable space. And so the fact that we can get thicker tomograms from our plasma generated lamella and still get usable contrast it is quite a positive in, in my view. And so now I'll hand over to Alex who will actually tell you more about the work that uh, he and the apps team at Thermo have been doing to uh, characterize xenon um, plasma. Yeah, thanks very much, Michael. So I would like to show you now a little bit of the work we have been done uh, utilizing the xenon beam on the plasma FIPS system. And what you can see here is a lamella that has been prepared using the xenon beam. It's a chlamydomona cell. Uh, we thinned that down uh, to 55 nanometers, exceptionally thin uh, lamella. So the 55 nanometers we measured on the tomogram we took from that uh, lamella sample. You can see a slice from the tomogram uh, on the right hand side, which clearly shows the thylakoid uh, membrane system uh, where you can see the photosystems also visible. Um, so this is a very similar method that we have produced with the xenon beam and that shows us that we can actually produce uh, high quality data, thin data with the, with the xenon beam. It will not be always required to have such thin samples, but the capability to produce thinner samples also allows us, of course, to go for higher resolution uh, uh, in the TEM later. Consistency is, of course, very important in the uh, in situ lamella production. So you can see that here for the for the automated lamella uh, preparation. Um, these are a number of uh, lamellae sites that have been defined and then automatically milled with the system down to the final polishing step. So there's no manual repolishing or kind of final polishing work needed for these samples. They can be now transferred directly into the uh, TEM system. These are the corresponding lamellae sites after transferring the TEM. You can see here some uh, low MAC overview images of the uh, lamellas produced. Um, the combination of the, uh, the automation software, which can automatically produce the thin lamellies, as well as the better connectivity with the, with the auto loader, gives us now the uh, chance to really produce a lot of lamellas from samples on the grid. Uh, with higher consistency and thereby we can also uh, get, of course, more areas that we can utilize um, for tomography data acquisition. Yeah, this slide shows that we can uh, reliably produce lamellae uh, with a thickness of less than 200 nanometers utilizing the, the xenon milling. Um, what we do to measure the thickness of a lamella is the following. So we typically take three tomograms, one close to the front edge of the lamella, uh, one in the middle and one of the end of the back end of the lamella. And then we average the thickness from these three tomograms to uh, yield the average thickness of the uh, lamella. From the tomograms, we measure the thickness by uh, looking at the Z height of the tomogram. That's the most precise way to measure this. And that's how we uh, establish the data points. So this shows 100 uh, cryolamelli tomograms, which, are, uh, which we took here. The average thickness is around 130 nanometers. So you can see here that we are definitely able to produce very thin lamelli with the xenon beam. So the thin lamelli will allow us to go to, to high resolution. Um, I mentioned it before, it will not be always required to prepare such thin lamellae, and uh, Michael also showed uh, results that were obtained from thicker lamellae, um, but it gives us confidence that we can utilize the system for a range of preparing different samples. 
Yeah, it's exciting times utilizing a plasma fib system for cryotomography sample preparation. And I think there are two things here with the new Arctis system that brings a better connectivity from the fib to the TEM. So that's what you see on the right hand side here. So the auto loader to auto loader lamella transfer enables us to produce also cleaner lamellae, which are less contaminated. Um, so that increases throughput uh, on the areas that we can use to acquire tomographic data on. And there are, I think, also new prospects um, when we compare the plasma FIP to, for instance, the gallium FIP systems. Uh, and that comes from the fact that uh, we uh, see, uh, I think, a better quality in the plasma FIP prepared lamellae. Uh, of course, one has to compare very accurately the same sickness, same imaging conditions on gallium versus plasma FIP data. But what we uh, see is, I think, that we get a bit better contrast out of the plasma FIP lamellae. Uh, and that would mean that we need, for instance, less particles uh, to obtain a certain resolution compared to gallium, where we may need more particles to get to the same level of resolution. The reason will have to do something with the different damage, damage mechanisms um, that occur on plasma and, and gallium uh, milling. Gallium, for sure, has the disadvantage that there's more implantation of metal ions into the sample um, uh, compared to, to plasma fib, um, Michael showed some data uh, on assessing uh, the damage for a plasma fib system. So I think there's a lot of prospects in, in utilizing uh, the plasma fib for uh, subtomogram averaging. And as more data becomes available, uh, we will see um, how that uh, evolves. Yeah, we also use uh, abundant cellular features such as the ribosomes uh, to uh, benchmark the resolution that we can get out of the plasma fib uh, data. Uh, you can see that we can get quite some high resolution from uh, really small amounts of data already on the PFIP systems. Uh, the left side shows an example we have done in collaboration with the Max Planck Institute and Martin Street that's done on uh, yeast particles looking at the uh, yeast ribosomes. And you can see here uh, overall 6.5 angstrom resolution structure obtained from a single lamella. So that's seven tomograms, which yielded 7,000 particles. Um, on the right hand side, you can see that we can also merge the particle pool uh, to increase uh, the available particles. So this is from 16 tomograms on the chlamydomonas cell, uh, yielding 5.5 angstrom resolution here. So clearly showing the way where we're going to really push also resolution subtomogram averaging as we make the uh, tomography sample preparation more consistent uh, utilizing the uh, plasma focused ion beam system. With this, we are coming to the end of this webinar. Um, we really hope that you were able to learn how sample preparation with the cryofib system uh, for tomography works and how that enables insights into cellular environments. Uh, we also hope that you were able to see how the new Arctis system can really be used to streamline the production of lamellae. Uh, from cellular samples, uh, bringing higher throughput and better connectivity uh, to the tomography workflow. Thanks again for attending, and Michael and I were both happy to answer some questions. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for the great presentations. Um, it looks like we have a few questions. So I'll first ask uh, the first question. There you guys are. Uh, welcome. Uh, so the first question is, um, is it necessary to cryocycle the Arctis frequently? There are quite a bit of debris. Does it accumulate on the sample? Um, please describe the situation. Yeah, so I, I can pick that one. So um, you have to do it once a week, I would say. So it's not much different than to the to the TEM systems where you do a cryo cycle. So uh, once a week, uh, warming it up and then uh, recycle kind, kind of cycling that's uh, sufficient. So there's a lot of cold surfaces inside which kind of trap a lot of the contaminants uh, that come from the milling. So um, yeah, it's not needed more than once a week. And it means also it can run then for um, a week. Uh, autonomously on the on the nitrogen tour. Okay. Okay. 
Thanks. Um, and I also say, you know, there's we have time for questions. If you haven't had a chance, um, please submit it in the, the answer or the chat box, and we'll be sure to get to it. Okay, the next question. Um, what are the differences between each available gas during milling? Michael, you want to say something to that? Yeah. Um, well, there's obviously the difference in the chemistry between the gases and um, the jury is still out as to which what which gas will be the best for milling of in using a plasma ion beam of course which is part of what we're trying to do with the rfi is to try and assess these different gases for their propensity to produce curtains or to um to mill at different rates um but yeah so generally the thicker the the the, the, rate of the atomic number the uh, less penetrative they are but they also will cause more damage in uh, uh, within that certain layer that they um within the sample so there is the fact that you have the atomic number but also you know the chemistry much different so in the case of nitrogen and oxygen there may be secondary effects but we still have to work that out okay. yeah i think there's a lot of things that that really needs to be worked out still it's not that there's a let's say a, a best suited ion yet so i mean there's the ability to explore the the ion um the different ion species for for milling these samples and that's i think i would say still ongoing work yeah. but generally uh, xenon is you know xenon, xenon is faster uh, has a faster split yield than argon um and nitrogen and oxygen are in between that um and gallium is slightly slower than nitrogen and oxygen with the data that we've measured so far okay so i, I think as a related question i something was do you expect to mill also thinner lamella with argon or is it only possible with xenon so so um they still needs optimization, right? So, you know, we did some first tests on HeLa cells, um, but it, we were still trying to optimize our recipe, maybe to try and get thinner lamella, but we just took a um, an empirical approach where we tried to aim for a thickness that's around 200 nanometers, and then we see what we get from a batch milling run. But I think it is possible to get thinner lamella with argon. It, you know, Alex's data showed that with xenon, you can get thinner lamella than what we obtained, but I think, um, the proof of the pudding is in the, is in the data acquisition and then the results from the tomography. So, okay, all right. Um, another, the next question then is: um, Is there a difference between the SEM columns of the Aquilos and the Arctis, or are they the same? Well, um, they are not exactly the same. So we use a, a slightly modified column that is also in use on the on the Aquilos, but it's really modified for the for the new system to kind of also meet all the the requirements in terms of working distances and how that kind of relates to um, you know to the to the alignments of the of the optic system. So it's a modified uh, column we are using there. Okay. Um it's also related, um, I have a question about the, the Tomo grid. So can these new clip rings also be used in the Aquilus II and the Cryos D4? Well, first of all, they are compatible with the outer loader systems of the of the Cryos so, and, and also the glacial systems. Um, so that's the most important thing that they are outer loader compatible. We could in theory also use them on the on the Aquilus, but we would need to do some modifications on the shuttles to really hold them. So that's uh, not done yet, but um, that's something which could be done. So, but at the moment, it's really uh, the outer loader compatibility, which is the kind of prime focus for for that uh, new type of grids, because we can really go then from outer loader to outer loader systems without any extra step. And uh, anything on the Aquilos would require to modify slightly the shuttles, for instance. Okay. Um, also, maybe stay with these kind of Aquilos questions. Uh, can the Aquilos two be upgraded to the Arctis? <laughs> That will be a difficult job, so okay. <laughs> I think the answer is no. <laughs> okay. All right, maybe uh, move on to the questions about the, the light microscope. So what is the axial resolution of the light microscope? Yeah, so it's, it's a good question. So the, I mean, the axial resolution is the most critical, uh, it's most critical for doing the exact targeting if you really want to, to target within, a, I don't know, 200 nanometer lamellae. Um, and I think the, the, the resolution is not better than, let's say, two microns. So that's a caveat because we have to use this uh, non-immersion low NA objectives. The point is we use a 0.75 um, lens, so we are around two microns in, um, 
in a axial um, resolution. But even if you would use a 0.95 lens, you would not be able to go below one micron. So, I mean, this is kind of the intrinsic limitation of this um, type of uh, objectives that we are using. So we have to apply some other uh, uh, yeah, kind of methods to kind of overcome this limitation for some fiducial based correlation or uh, techniques like this. Okay. Um, and another question, Louise, is um, in your slide 19 are like one, two, three points used for the alignment of the light microscope image and the SEM image? In your slide, uh, okay. Yeah. I think I got it. So it's, uh, yeah, so um, basically, I mean, in the, we can flip the stage also 180 degrees. So if we have a thicker sample, we can image it with the light microscope from, let's say, the top. And, and if, we, if we are not seeing it from the bottom side, we can kind of flip it and then image it um, uh, from the other side. So if you are not flipping it and if you just keep your sample uh, in the milling position and you can image the, the sample from underneath with the light microscope, then there's technically no need to kind of do a correlation because you're not moving anything. So um, uh, when we flip it, there may be a, a slight uh, correlation that is uh, that, that can be done to align to the SEM image. Um, but I think one of the advantages is having it at the same coincidence point is that we don't need to do this kind of correlations um, uh, that we would normally do if we come from an external system uh, where we need to import uh, spatial coordinates and align it to the SM. So that's the advantage of having it in one point. Okay. Um, how precisely does the light microscope estimate the position of a fluorescent signal in the z-axis to the target position of the interest in the cell? Um, additionally, can light microscope be used simultaneously during milling to see a signal? And make sure that it will not mill away any position of interest. Michael, you want to say something? Or should I go first? Yeah, so, I mean, well, so the axis that we've been developing at the RFI, right, so is a is a prototype. So the 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 optics on our are slightly different, I think, to the commercial at the moment. So we don't have a a full answer to that at our institute, um, but. Typically, I would, you know, 300 um, in X, Y, and 2 micron uh, in Z is typically the values. So, so yeah, we, we, we have a lot of work to do to, um, to optimize our fluorescence imaging um, coincident during milling, so we can get the targets uh, properly localized. But yeah, and that's our experience so far. Yeah, that, I mean, this is one of the yeah, essential questions. And I mean, there are some techniques to kind of overcome that. Um, I think having the capability to also mill and simultaneously check, for instance, the milling outcome with the light microscope is definitely an advantage to also see stepwise where we are with the milling. There are also some publications coming up where you localize the fluorophore uh, in your cell. And uh, as you mill, you kind of uh, detect the loss of fluorescence um, inside the fluorophore to, as an indication that you're kind of closer to the target. I mean, so there are some ways to, to, to get more precise, but it's of course still a, a challenge also to really get this um, targeting accuracy to the point that you always have it in the lamella, but it significantly increased the probability that we kind of catch the, the, the fluorescent targets. Yeah, you, you avoid some of the, you know, the coincidence registration um, problems that you have where you have a fluorescent module off axis. But we just need to characterize that a bit more and ensure what our success will be. Okay. Um, I'm going to maybe switch topics to getting a lot of questions about the, the sample um, itself. So what is the size limit of the sample, kilodalton or nanometers? that we can extract the data from, especially on membrane complexes such as GPCR, 100 kilodaltons or less? Well, that's talking about in the tomograms in the end, right? So a cryo-electron tomography mm -hmm. question. So, I mean, typically, if you can identify a, a globular domain on a protein within a membrane, then you might be able to do some subtomography. tomography For example, that's why the GABA receptor is quite a good target for that. But if they're fully integral membranes, they're actually quite hard to see because they have a very similar contrast scale to the membrane itself. So in that instance, the size is less important than actually, you know, the fact that it's embedded within the lipid membrane. But I think typically if it's 250 kilodotons and above, it, you can probably have a chance to readily identify it and, and do some sort of analysis. 
And then I think below that, you know, that becomes like a, a real research question for computation and uh, different um, detection and algorithms. Maybe this is the sample question I was getting to. So what um, you mentioned that you could study load samples for organelles prepared with um, high pressure freezing. Can you load the obtained waffle grid directly on the tomogram and use the plasma fib for the remaining steps, or do you need to use the cryo ultratome, uh, micro ultratome beforehand? Yeah, so I, 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 I start because I, I made this more sketch with the organoids as a kind of illustration what is possible to do. I mean, it's possible to sandwich, for instance, grids in the high pressure freezer and kind of produce this type of waffle or ice disk grids. And um, those can be clipped into the thermo grids. They can be also clipped in regular auto grids and then processed. Of course, if we have such bulk amounts of ice, we can really utilize the plasma fib to really remove the, the ice at faster rates. It would be, of course, appealing also to directly freeze in the carriers, for instance. That's something maybe for the future to come. But it's one way to kind of process this sample. It's not the only way to do the, the lamella prep. There are also other ways to expose thicker samples and then do some uh, large lamella preparation. I didn't go into the details for that. Um, yeah, you, you have noticed there is no lift out system on the on the Arctis uh, at this point. The lift out is also another technique which is really with with uh, that amount of throughput that we want to generate there. But I think there are some inroads with uh, high pressure prepared samples such as the, the waffle grids, uh, where that system can become really interesting. And especially if we look into more bulk tissues, and that's also something I think Michael has an interest in to, to look into uh, kind of yeah, biopsy and then into the uh, into that into more detail. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously limited by the, the freezing physics, right? So anything that's two or 300 microns or bigger, you can't really, you have to then do some sectioning beforehand. Um, but the plasma can be used at all the steps, I think, as long as you have it, uh, you know, frozen hydrated on a, on a support that is compatible with the instrument, then the plasma fit is quite versatile in that regard. Okay. Um, maybe a straightforward question. What is the temperature of the sample in the fib? Well, this, the temperature is always at... Uh, we have to keep this, the temperature, of course, around liquid nitrogen temperatures. So we are in the range of minus 180 uh, degrees Celsius. So to, to be really on the safe side that the sample is not undergoing the phase transition uh, from the vitreous state into the, the uh, crystalline state. Okay. Um, I see that we're running out of time, so I think this will be the last question today, and we'll be sure to answer any questions we didn't answer um, afterward directly. So the last question will be, can you elaborate on why the cryo-TM contrast from plasma is better than lamelling from traditional gallium lamella? Um, so, so during the talk, Alex mentioned implantation, right? So that's one potential theory that because gallium is sort of four times the atomic number of the typical atoms you might expect to find in a biological sample. It implants on the surface to a degree and uh, that ablates or reduces the contrast and generating more transmission electron microscope. Um, but that's, you know, that's the, that's the idea, but that's a real, that's an experiment that we'd like to do using something like EELS or EDX, where we try to measure the amount of gallium on a gallium generated lamella and compare that to the other gases in an iron coupled device. Um, the other one could be the, the, the lower con the lower contamination rates in the in the actus itself. So, you know, the reported thickness really should be um, what the lamella thickness is without any extra redeposited ice. Um, so that's that's kind of the two two potential modes. Is that you know the, the thickness we measure is really the thickness we measure and traditional lamella thickness is in a bit. Including uh, including the ray deposited layer as well that you can't really see. Um, so those are the two reasons I think um, I think of mainly. Yeah, and we are just in the beginning also understanding the damage mechanisms. I think uh, Michael's and, and the crew they kind of did a first start uh, assessing also damage for the plasma systems, which is important. We now need to compare it also for gallium, where there is a bit more simulation data there, but not really comparative data. And maybe it's really due to the fact that there's more gallium implantation, which kind of 
has an has an influence on the high frequency information that we can obtain from this uh, lamelli samples that makes the plasma uh, kind of of better. But again, it's kind of early days, and it's kind of we really need to to look at that in in really detail to to see what's um, yeah what is the uh, yeah what is the, what are the real differences there and, and how forms especially damage kind of compares between plasma and, and gallium fib systems. Well, I want to thank you both uh, for your presentation today. Um, and unfortunately, if we this is all the time we have today, and if we didn't get to your question, we'll be sure to answer this by email. I want to let everyone to know that this webcast and the others in our series can be viewed on demand at LabRoots. Um, you can also register for upcoming events here. Um, we encourage you to share this session with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. Um, and if as much as we've enjoyed these online events, if you are in the Boston area next week, uh, please join us on September um, 27th for an in-person demonstration of one of our other cryo um, TM tools, the uh, Pacific Scientific Tundra. And in, as a last thank you to everyone, if you are still need more for, for cryotomography in your day, uh, please visit thermofisher.com forward slash Arctis. Uh, you can download uh, many information here about the, the Arctis and see some additional videos. And before we go, I just want to thank uh, the speakers again and the audience for joining us. Um, and for all the interesting questions that we answered. Um, if you have any additional questions, be sure to answer them, um, or you can use the form online on that page to ask them as well. So thank you again for today's speakers, to Alex and Michael, and especially to all of you for joining us. Until next time, bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Happy PFIP, Melissa.